Welcome to another episode of You Are Here. Joining me today is Mark McCright. How are you doing, Mark? Doing well. How are you? Good, good. Glad to have you back. Uh, you're becoming the the unofficial co-host here, so that's good to have you. Your knowledge <laughs> is greatly appreciated and your opinions. Uh, today you're joining me because uh, we have a new CD coming out. It's kind of a surprise. We didn't let anybody know about this one. It's a CD called Covers. It's a compilation CD of cover songs that Kevin was involved with throughout his career. It has 13 tracks, including five previously unreleased studio recordings. Another three tracks are presented here for the first time on the KMG label. Today, we're going to go ahead and on this episode, evaluate some of the songs, give you clips of each one, and just kind of let you know what the packaging's about and uh, give you a general sense and idea of this release. Now, the cool thing about this album is, or this CD, is we incorporated a bunch of the musicians who performed on these songs. And we contacted them, and this package is full of liner notes from Kevin, um, from Mark Bonilla, Brian McLeod, and uh, some other musicians and friends of Kevin's. So each track gives you kind of a little storyline of, of of how it's came to be or a little anecdote within it um let's just jump right in there mark um the first one is salisbury hill now it's a peter gabriel tune and what's really odd about this one is um it was recorded in 1985 you can tell from the production of it especially um but Kevin sings it in his natural voice, unlike the Call Me Kai sessions, which were out a couple months ago. <laughs> it's funny. That, that's exactly the comment that I was going to say about listening to this is it's it's, uh, you know, he had that that sort of high, very almost like John Anderson, really uh, no vibrato, no, you know, kind of piercing thing, not piercing in a bad way, but just, you know, he was going for a certain style with all the, the Kai stuff, sometimes even speeding his voice up. And uh, uh, it was interesting because he's covering Peter Gabriel with this kind of low husky voice. And so it almost sounds like it's uh, vocally, it's more recent and, you know, more evolved than some of the earlier stuff. Which is funny because it predates a lot of that. So you're right. Yeah. Um, let's get into a little sample of that. I'll play you the beginning of it here. It's definitely a, his natural voice there. And I think people are listening to it right now with their eyes wide open going, wow. And, um, and there's a reason why we didn't put this on the Call Me Kai set because it, Kevin didn't have it set for the Call Me Kai set or those, those albums. So um, the good thing is we get, we get the good treat here. Now, Kevin did all the instruments on it, all the programming. And in this time, he also did Carpet Man which is on the Call Me Kai set. And as we indicated, these are in his natural voice. So let's give them a little bit of this to start off. But you're never ever stop the thing. She walks on
Now, the cool thing about that is that it, it's when you do listen to the entire track, it you hear the difference immensely from the Call Me Kai version. The instrumentation, there's different instrumentation throughout uh, the background vocals and just a little bit of the of the format, the way he did that. Uh, what do you think about that version? I actually prefer this version. <laughs> um, you know, the 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 over the top '80s production and what have you on Call Me Kai sometimes gets in the way of of the great songwriting. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I don't know, it, it's kind of a toss up because I mean, obviously the call me Kai one is more polished and more finished and more deliberate. And this one's like really rough around the edges, but, um, I kind of like the fact that it's not polished with an eighties brush. Yeah. And it, as his vocals, when he's doing a little, what do you call it? A improv at the end or something. And it's just, it's mm -hmm. a lot better than the call me Kai. So you got to wonder where yeah, there, there were some different musical sections in this one that or at least the arrangement yes. made them sound like different yeah. sections and uh in this one than the other one and the other thing is just i'm not a fan of slap bass <laughs> there's slap bass all through the other one uh you know on call me kai right on okay so now we're moving right along because we have like i said we have 13 tracks we want to get to and there's some that we want to talk about a little bit more some we want to just let you guys enjoy um now we come into the section of of the cover CD, and to let everyone know, it's it's formatted chronologically, it's sequenced chronologically as best possible, and you can listen to this album from beginning to end, and as one experience, it's sequenced as such. But now we come into track three, four, and five are the toy matinee era, and the touring era of toy matinee, and. It is now the third unreleased tr track. So Salisbury Hill, Carpet Man, and El Paso now. These are three unreleased tracks. Um, a little bit of backstory about El Paso. This was done in uh, for the Mark and Brian radio show on 95.5 KLOS in Los Angeles. And uh, one of the DJs, Mark Thompson, is a huge fan of the song El Paso from Marty Robbins. So Brian Phelps, his partner, uh, contacted Kevin and Mark Bonilla and asked them if he, they could do a remake of El Paso for, for um, Mark's birthday show. Kevin and Mark obliged and they came across with this. Out in the West Texas town of El Paso I fell in love with a Mexican girl Nighttime would find me in Rosa's cantina Music would play and Felina would whirl Blacker the night were the eyes of Felina Wicked and evil while casting her spell My love was deep for this Mexican maiden I was in love, but in vain I could tell. One night a wild young cowboy came in, wild as the West Texas wind. Dashing and daring a drink he was sharing. It's one of those ones where it's just, it's so funny that you just, you want to play it from beginning to end, because especially the end has some change lyrics in there i don't know if you've caught onto that from the yeah, original yeah. so it's a nice little punchline at the end um i think uh I, I thought this was interesting sequencing wise because it feels like this is a little bit of a time jump but maybe just because it was a point in his career where there was a lot of growth over a couple of years and um but but this is a really like you know sounds like four track cassette or like you know really low brow recording um you know and it kind of has the same spirit as some of that real early stuff yeah so i thought that was kind of cool and and uh the i I was, I was like listening when they broadcast this that was this was like back i before i'd met him or anything like that. 1990 and, and yeah i was just a yeah just a fan and um it uh uh i i so i'm really sentimental about this one and 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 that kind of thing but the uh my favorite thing about it is all of the little uh, guitar fills that Mark Benia does, because uh, I don't, I don't know, I've never compared them to the original mm -hmm. to know if he actually like, you know, copped any of the original 
riffs, but you can hear toward the end he plays "Close to the Edge" by Yes, yeah. and and uh, you know they talk about uh, when he's talking about the horse, it's got the William Tell overture and like a death march when they talks about dying and like it's it's just it's it's there's so it's many really hidden gems commentary. there's so many hidden gems within this and virtually with some of the other tribute songs that kevin touched but um you 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 hit that well is that mark bonilla is very integral for a part of this um toy matinee touring entity and him and kevin worked well together you've heard all the stuff that they've done or most of the stuff and um uh, the great part is his his backing vocals even in this song you can hear them you know yeah, just yeah. they come through just so well now this was a very difficult this was the this was the stickler for this album um back in 1990 when kevin performed this and it, he performed it live also at the christmas show for mark and brian and he, they, he gave him this track and they they played it you know during the birthday show and it became a mini cult classic in Los Angeles. And it kind of worked in reverse for Kevin's career because when he was then touring with Toy Matinee in the LA area, everyone was there was from Mark and Brian for the most part. And so they had heard El Paso. So a lot of times he was t being yelled at from the, from the audience, you know, El Paso, El Paso. And um, he had some pretty standard pat, you know, answers and replies to people in Ventura theater. He, he replied saying, you know, oh, the record company doesn't allow us to, to, to play that song. You know, we'll get in trouble if we do it. <laughs> so um, he would play, you know, maybe 20 seconds of it, just really a quick little dweedle dweedle of it. Um, but this was one that we held on and held on and held on to, to not release until this time, this time was probably the right time in kevin's what would have been would have been kevin's career at this point um because he just wasn't he wasn't in this in the song way back then um so it's 30 plus years later here it is finally um <laughs> now as i said we're in the toy matinee era 1990 91 and that brings us to funeral for a friend love lies bleeding burn down the mission and that is an elton john classic and or a couple of classics put into into one and when the the fans get this package what they're going to be this is when they're going to really really start getting into the beef of things and the liner notes because mark bonilla delivers and he delivers well in this one um he worked with us on this uh getting us some information about these tracks so so um we won't really give it away but what did you think overall of the liner notes as a whole mark yeah it was it was it was cool like like you said i don't want to give it away because uh you know as i was looking through this stuff there were definitely things that i learned and you know it's like i think you and i are in the same and probably a lot of people watching this this broadcast are like you know you feel like there's not a lot left to learn and it's and it's but but that's not true of course because you know every you know it's, it's like there are always things coming up and it's great to hear it like right from the source yeah, we tried to pack as much. But some of them, even even stuff that Kevin wrote too. Yeah, and there, there's things on there that you know that obviously were brand new revelations for me. But we did try to pack as much into this package as possible, as we do with everything, with dates, with um, personnel involved. And I think we this one is pretty pretty well established there. So let's get to this. This is the uh, the three track monster from the Toy Matinee Live album. Um, now. To stop down here, this is a live track, and there's only, I believe, two live tracks on here. And um, what's really cool is that when, when you get to this track on here, it almost doesn't seem like it's live. Both tracks, when you listen to them, you hear some audience, you know, at the end, at the tail end and throughout, but it's pretty interesting um, the way we formatted this in. Another 
any thoughts on that one it's a favorite well i mean that one that's another one that brings back memories because i was actually in the audience at the roxy yeah. that night so you know that was really cool um it was nice getting the pro recording because of course you know i'm like sitting there bootlegging the show <laughs> <laughs> um and and uh that was another one where n that song isn't on it but uh but westwood one actually you know pressed that show up on vinyl five songs from it yes and uh uh and so i've got that as well which is kind of cool to get that on vinyl yeah but, but um i, th I thought it, it was a cool it, it's obvious that kevin was like going through a heavy elton john phase at the time because you know in the in the rehearsal disc he does rocket man mm -hmm. i've heard him do tiny dancer i think it's on a radio broadcast somewhere and he did this song and then and then uh you know the obvious thing is that for, for me when I first heard, um, uh, uh, oh God, why can't I not remember the name of the song from the rock opera? Uh, best Laid Plans. plans? It, yeah, it, it's like, like Best Laid Plans borrows heavily from yes. what you just played. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I thought was really interesting about this track is that I felt like it really captures, and it's a great vehicle for that particular uh, band with Mark Benia and, you know, all those guys. And, um, I, I don't think it would have been a very cool vehicle for the original studio toy matinee band. I would, I, I think that if they were going to play live and do something, they probably would have done, you know, something from Peter Gabriel or Steely, Steely Dan, Dan or some that. other kind of thing. Yeah. Something like really slick. Um, and whereas this was much more of a, like a rock band. Yeah, totally. You got it right there. And, um, and we did include, the decision was made to include some of these tracks, like the next one coming up here, um, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which comes from uh, the um, acoustic CD that we have out there. And the reason why we included some of these were because uh, these things are going out of print and they won't be in production any longer. In fact, Toy Matinee Acoustic, if I recall, only has um, like 20 copies left or something like that. So who knows, once we, this airs, they may be gone. But they will not be uh, reprinted in CD form. Definitely not. So we included this, and it's obviously remastered, but um, it came out five, six years ago on Toy Matinee Acoustic. That's just a little snippet. Everyone's heard that one. Um, what are your thoughts on that song? Um, I mean, that one's cool because there there are three different versions of it. Um, you know, there's the the version that he, they played at the actual show where there were drums, mm -hmm. and then there's the version that he did with Jonathan Brooke late in his career, which was like a whole completely other kind of invention of the song. And I, I think I think this is my favorite version. The um, the one with drums, they had some problems with the mix. They like muted the guitar at the beginning mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And and uh, this one just really is a I, I thought was a really nice performance that he captured. And you can really like hear the intricacies of the guitar, the vocal, and and what he did with it. I'd always loved that song um, in particular, uh, and one of my favorite Christmas songs. And um, uh, you know, it was I thought his take on it was really cool. This is much more faithful to kind of like what i think of when i think of the song mm -hmm. although it's like kind of a definitive version uh whereas the other one's like like i love the other one too it's just a totally different thing the jonathan one or the drum one the jonathan one okay the one where it's like you know it's like a dark yeah statement moody kind of and thing, broody whereas and... this is yeah so a little bit of backstory on that uh with the release of this album this cd called covers one of the first things we tried to do with this is go into the to the multi-track for O Come O Come Emmanuel, the studio version with Jonathan. Kevin had written in the in his notes that he had a guide track, a vocal track on that. Uh, so we went in and checked it out because we were going to see if he had a complete vocal track to do his his own version. Uh, unfortunately, it was only scat vocals and and some stuff here and there. So. 
So that idea was next. So we went ahead and, and pulled this version off of the acoustic one. Um, so that concludes the toy matinee section of covers. And now we get to uh, 1995. And this one, this song, The Joker, it's the Steve Miller band classic. Some people call it a classic, others can't stand it. And this is a weird one. This is a very weird part of the career for Kevin because 1995, uh, Tuesday Music Club had already run its course with the Sheryl Crow era and that album. And Kevin was now, you know, in the thud era, as we call it, and branching off and, and starting Caviar and, and that stuff, um, including the rock opera that he was working on th throughout all of that. So what's interesting is that Kevin was contracted to to work on the Pompatis of Love soundtrack for Sheryl Crow. And she was going to do the song called The Joker. So at the end of those sessions, Kevin gave a whack at what he thought it should sound like. So what we did was uh, this is remixed um, by John Cunaberti from The Masters. And let's just, let's just jump right into it. Let's give him a few seconds in and see how this sounds. Now, right there, he does a little bit of what, what, what Kevin refers to as his Eddie Murphy laugh. He did that also in Joytown, and there's a couple other songs. I actually asked him about that one time, and he said, oh, you caught on to my Eddie Murphy laugh. That's one of his natural laughs that he can't control. And <laughs> so, so I've, in listening to a bunch of the archives, I've caught a bunch of those little laughter tracks that he has, and some of them are buried in the mixes, but they're there. So that's pretty cool. Um, Kevin playing bass throughout. I mean, it's 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 his song almost when you when you listen to this. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the I love how I mean the you know the laughs kind of you know it it the whole thing feels pretty spontaneous. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the way that you describe it, where it's like, yeah, they've just been working on this, so the music's all tight, and he's like, yeah, let me take a shot at it. It's like uh, that's kind of what it sounds like, and I think it's really cool. The thing that I really liked about this one was that that was when I kind of got to know him and the band through, you know, and and uh, that was uh, so it was the the Corky and Toss era, and uh, there's not really a lot recorded from them, so I thought that was kind of cool to have something that was a a good document of that, and it um, uh, it reminds me actually a little bit of when you give your love to me when the guitar strumming kicks in and it's got the kind of countryish kind of thing um so yeah very cool and i contacted corky james who plays guitar in it and he he barely remember anything on it he said they were doing so many things at that time they were they were involved in so many projects and and you know jumping in different you know pieces of pies so he could he i played him some some parts of it and he was going wow play me some more guitar <laughs> so <laughs> even some of these guys you know 25 years later it's it's difficult to to pinpoint certain things well and I'd, I'd heard about this but I didn't even realize that the that the Cheryl Crow recording of it had actually made its way out and so it sounds I mean if it's not the same take it's it's like 
for the same session because it's the same arrangement and everything and you can find it on youtube it's it never came out like on a cd but it was used in the uh, in credits of that movie you were talking about. right and and it is there are different instruments in it because i did a b it i did check on certain things there are there mm -hmm. are some things unless they're you know hidden in the in the original mix or what have you yeah um okay so now we're in the middle of the, of the disc now and we're we're towards the middle of uh 1995 i guess the time frame would be and for some reason maybe you know you're more involved in the prog world but there were a couple of tribute albums that started coming out and uh, i guess a resurgence in prog in the mid 90s um what was going on at that time that that there were a couple of magna carta releases for you know genesis for for yes there were all these tribute albums coming out kevin did the lamb you know tribute performance why was there so much in the mid 90s um, I think there were there were a lot of things going on. I mean, the the like the Magna Carta uh, was was this a Magna Carta? Release? I don't believe the... the Supper's Ready was. Okay, but the I think the yes, yes was. one was right. So there there were a few labels that were, you know, trying to like put together. It's it's all it was guys like Billy Sherwood mm -hmm. and Robert Berry and like some of that kind of stuff. They they uh they would try to put put together just interesting collections of people and and make covers and they. There, I know there was a Pink Floyd one um, at one point as well, uh, but but there were quite a few of those kind of things. I think it was just kind of as as the the like the current prog music was kind of you know gathering some steam, like with the prog fest that Kevin was playing and Spock's beard was you know more active and all of that kind of stuff. And and uh, so I think there was just more interest, and they were really trying to kind of the record labels were trying to tune in to that audience but this is actually the standout track on the cd for me this is my favorite by far on the covers disc <laughs> yeah oh cool and what's what's yeah. i mean i'd heard it but it's yeah go ahead well what's cool is that now it's finally in kevin's home library of releases before it was just yeah. stuck on a tribute which is great it did great on that but you know that was 25 years ago so now it's great to have it in the kmg catalog so uh, let's give you a little bit of that let me out of Pontiac when I was just 17. I had to get it out of me. How how true is that to the original to the Genesis version? Um, well, it's like there there are sections of it that sound pretty true to the Genesis version, and then there are sections that don't. It's kind of like Cashmere, where he starts out with the strumming acoustic and that kind of thing. And I really like I like it actually better here than on. Uh, well, I like it in both places, but this one just I, I like the song. <laughs> and. Uh, 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 and then there's the little toy instruments breakdown in the middle that's really cool. And then at the end, when it kind of gets jazz and you've got the trombone solo and that kind of thing, that was, uh, um, to me, that's like a really clear nod to Living in the City by Stevie Wonder. And I, just the way that he put all that stuff together is really cool. I never really got this song from The Lamb. Mm -hmm. um, the, there were quite a, I, I mean, the... The Lamb is one of my favorite records ever. I don't think there's anything that sounds like it before or since by Genesis or anyone else. Um, and I know Kevin was really into that, but uh, uh, you know, it's it's grown to be probably one of my favorite records ever. And um, and his whole involvement with that and seeing that show was uh, was part of that experience. Well, that's great. Part of formulating that opinion. Oh yeah, no, that's great. Uh, yeah, I'm not being a prog fan, as you know. It, this is this is my introduction to the Lamb and stuff through Kevin. So, it's always interesting to hear, you know, the the people who are hardcore Genesis fans or even just prog in general hearing his take on these things. And that brings us to the next track, which is another Genesis song. So, which is interesting or not, 
Salisbury Hill started it off Peter Gabriel solo. And now in the middle of this disc, we have two Genesis tracks, obviously a big part of Kevin's, you know, history and in, in listening and, and his likes. Now we come to the colony of Slipperman from the lamb lies down on Broadway 20th anniversary performance that Kevin did at the variety arts theater in, um, in Los Angeles back in 1994. And um, back in New York city and colony of Slipperman, people are going to love the liner notes on these. I feel because they're, they come direct from Kevin and just to let people know, Kevin sequenced a bunch of this disc himself. He kind of got in there and he formulated a, a few albums that he had going at the time. You know, obviously he was doing Caviar. He was doing uh, Shaming of the True. And then he had some other albums that he kind of was putting on back burners. And one of them was appeared to be a covers album. So... A lot of these tracks, I should say maybe half of them, are sourced directly from Kevin. And Colony of Slipperman is one that he he chose. And he writes about it and why he chose it and what it's why it's included in here. Um, so this is one where when you get to this, after you listen to Back in New York City, Mark, Colony of Slipperman starts. And this is one where you don't, if the listener didn't know it, they wouldn't know that it's a live track. Um, right. The way it begins and the way it ends, you virtually don't hear any audience members. So it, it's pretty cool. I wandered lonely as a cloud Till I came upon this dirty street I've never seen a stranger crowd Your up is disgracing, one facing me moves to say hello. Now, what's your view on the colony of Slipperman coming in? within within the sequence of the album, of the covers album, and coming after back in New York City? Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's obviously they're they're both Genesis tracks from the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, so that works. But it's. Uh, it's interesting that you know you're coming out of something that sounds more like Stevie Wonder going into Genesis, but it's also kind of you're you're getting more and more proggy sounding because even with then with the next track you're kind of thrown into full blown prog prog mode. I mean this one is already there, but it's kind of like introducing that that section of the record. Um, I think uh, th this is another one where I was in the audience for the show and and uh, it was just amazing. Uh, I remember my wife was not around because she was off training to be a flight attendant and just calling her and saying, oh my God, I can't even describe what I saw. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it, the other thing that was interesting about that show is that um, I had, uh, uh, that was, um, you know, I was hanging out with Dave and going to see the shows and, you know, that kind of stuff at the time. And so I, you know, everyone knew that I was into collecting bootlegs and all that kind of stuff. And I had just spent way too much money on a, uh, a Lamb Lies Down on Broadway show. And it was the first one that ever leaked out that was a complete show from the soundboard with all of the stories intact mm -hmm. and stuff. And so Kevin actually like borrowed that to study it and check it out to, you know, as part of learning, learning the, um, you know, learning the set for, uh, for prog fest. So that was really cool. Yeah. And, and once again, here, here is the inclusion of a live track, but it comes from the, the CD lamb lies down on Broadway 20th anniversary that is now out of print. So now mm -hmm. this is the only way you can grab this in CD form. So that's another highlight of this is that you get it. And it's a little bit of a remastered job there. Um, you said it gets a little bit proggy in this section, this this middle section of the disc. And one of the reasons is because it goes into the next track, Siberian Kachu. And this is from Yes. This is originally done by Yes. And um, I guess we should talk about the personnel on this and, and on um, back in New York City, I guess. Uh, in this track, we have Brian Beller playing bass and Mike Keneally playing, I believe, guitar and some other instruments. Um, you can hear that difference in this track, especially this track with Brian Beller, Nick DiVirgilio, Kevin, and Keneally. 
this could have been a tight unit right here. I would have loved oh, to have yeah. heard what they would have done. Let's hear the sample of this Siberian Katru. One of those tracks, I just I want to let it go all the way because the harmony throughout. <laughs> Kevin um, does the the low vox vocals, I think. Keneally does the mid range, and uh, Nick does the high parts. So, um, what do you think if they would have been? A, that, what about that four piece? What do you think they could have done? Oh yeah, that would have been awesome. But uh, you know, I I think. I think Kevin kind of considered Prague to be somewhat of a guilty pleasure, um, you know, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I don't know that he would have really dove headfirst into something like that, but because, um, I mean, he, he was so, the stuff that he at least presented publicly as like the evolution of his career, that would have been a pretty big left turn, but who knows? I mean, maybe, uh, uh, maybe somewhere down the road, that would have been really cool. And he would have embraced that. But uh, uh, they, that, that's what one of the things that I really like about this is the groove and the chemistry is just amazing. Because I've always, I mean, I love that song by Yes. But um, first of all, the in, in Yes, they have a really unique sounding vocal blend. But, you know, it's like, no one really wants to hear Steve Howe sing on his own. <laughs> and, um, and, and it's like, those guys are all like really strong singers and they have, uh, I think a really cool blend. And then, yeah, the, just the bass and drum groove is it's there, there's nothing wrong with the bass and drum groove of yes, absolutely. Of course, <laughs> but it's interesting to hear something that just has such a more laid back, uh, you know, feel um, with it. And now the original, they were originally going to call this track Siberian Snow. And right. the band was, they named themselves Stanley Snail. And they called them, this song was going to be Siberian Snow. And then they changed it to Siberian Kachu. All S's. The what? And it's all S's. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a pretty interesting. Yeah. And that's because the, uh, toward, toward the end of the song, it, it, uh, they, they take a sort of a left turn where they, they build up vocally and then it hits this high note, which is different than on the original, and it goes into a different song. Um, and I I didn't know it's a song by Bruford mm -hmm. uh, uh, from one of his solo albums, which I wasn't familiar with, but I was uh, very familiar with the UK bootlegs. Um, and uh, uh, the the on the first UK tour, it was Bruford and Holdsworth and like the people that played on on this, you know, or at least those two guys, uh, you know, and and so they they actually did that song live at UK concerts, and uh, so it, it was really weird when it went into it, and I was just like, hey, where do, where have I heard this? Before? Yeah, and I think they wanted to just but, leave it as a surprise like that, and that's why they changed it back mm -hmm. to Siberian Katru as the name, not to throw people off with what's Siberian Snow. So. Yeah, well, and it's on a Yes tribute album, yeah. so you know it's like they might not want to advertise. It's like, oh yeah, and then we're doing a Bru but I guess Bruford, at least a Bruford solo thing, is still yes, yeah, to a degree. Uh, you could see it that way. And this this prog section in here, it's it starts with back in New York City, which is kind of like you said, it's kind of a little you know gets that little better groove and stuff like that. And then we go into calling a slipper man, which gives them a little bit more prog. And then you just hit them with Siberian Katri right here. So yeah. the listener, it kind of, kind of gradually takes them into Kevin's career of prog. And then, and then we slap them back into, into to rock with the standard cashmere. 
cashmere that's been on a bunch of releases we it, um originally it was the ep from thud and that got so so much um critical acclaim that they ended up putting it as the ep on there and then we released it in the thud 20th anniversary and it's also released on um i believe nuts the album nuts and which is also going out of print so these are you know um thud is almost sold out nuts and bolts are almost sold out so as we said this cashmere it's it's home is going to be here um we'll just get a little bit of that i think people pretty much know what it is What can be said that hasn't been said about cashmere all these times, huh? Yeah, I mean, I, I what I really like is is how the, it it when it starts because he's you know using it's got uh, Satnam on the toplas mm-hmm. and the sitar and all, all the that kind of stuff. It's interesting to hear the actual Indian musical influences in it more so than you even hear it in the in the Zeppelin version. Um, so I thought that was really clever. And the other thing I like about it that's cool is when the groove kicks in and it's 4-4 four, four and you just don't expect that at all. Um, it's right in your face it, at that it, point. Uh, yeah, I mean, it it turns it into a different kind of track, but then he's still kind of floating out of time mm-hmm. over it with the vocal, which is really cool. Um, so, yeah, I... I I, I really have always loved this one. Yeah, it's crazy. when he played it on Mark and Brian, he said, "Oh yeah, it was just like some rough mix I threw together," and it was like, <laughs> "Okay, yeah, one of Kevin's rough mixes, I guess, is uh, you know pretty amazing." And I, I still don't. I've never tried to a b it with what they played on the radio that day with what finally got released, but I'll bet it wasn't that different. <laughs> well, there is a second mix. There is a definite second section remix Mm -hmm. of that which does sound different and you can hear differences but more so it's just it's kind of like a panning type of thing in a way but but there Mm -hmm. it is noticeable so and that may have a home later on in the future maybe as a digital download or something like that but um we i took some thought and you know do we want to release that one on this it may not be as great to other people as i think it is so we stood with the you know the tried and true one um yeah okay now we bring it way down so we rocked Mm -hmm. out we you know we jumped into the prog scene and then we rocked out with little led zeppelin and now we bring it down with uh jane sibbery's uh taxi ride i've called a taxi and it's coming That one comes off of the Bolts album, which uh, you can get right now, kevingilbert.com. You're in take on it. You read the liner notes. Those come from Kevin. We're not going to spoil it on that one, but um, I, yeah. I think those liner notes right there are going to be talked about a lot. Yeah. it's uh, That one was interesting because I know there was, I forget what, what interview it was, but there was a radio station interview where they said, is there anyone that you'd really like to work with someday? And he said, Jane Seabury. And I wasn't really familiar with her. My wife actually owned this CD. Um, and uh, I, what I like about this is that um, just 
Kevin playing piano and singing is really amazing. Um, and that's, I guess just, there's a, there's something about that style. I've, I've got, uh, uh, there's some other artists that I like that like are mainly piano and vocal. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, you know, I, that's what I loved about God's been tapping my phone, the best of everything. There are several of them where like, you know, that's how it's presented, but this one, um, it, uh, I, I, it really makes me wonder if this was kind of an inspiration for the arrangement of song for a dead friend, because it has kind of that it, it's the same, some of the similar chords. It's the same kind of like, you know, really builds and dips and, and everything. And it, and it's very emotional. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, that I often wonder about that. Yeah. I think I, this, I wonder if he actually made this more like song from, from a dead friend song for a dead friend because this one mm -hmm. came after it so i believe because song for a dead friend but the original was the originals back from like the mid 80s though like the actual right. song yes the jane seabury version yes so yeah i see what you're saying the mood of, of her original one yeah that could have been true on that i see what you're saying now. yeah 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 um now now we're we're getting to the last two tracks so the jane seabury song is 1995 and now we come to spring of 1996 and we come to the group called Ketamin and there's only one release out there. It's called um, Dance Across the Universe Volume 1 and it's a compilation of dance music and techno music and you'll see it on there. It says Strong Enough from the Ketamin and this is a Cheryl Crow cover. So this was a weird one because it's Kevin covering his own writing, his own co-writing parts um, from Cheryl Crow's Tuesday Music Club album, the song Strong Enough. And uh, Brian has some notes in there, talks about how they came up about this. And um, let's just, I guess before we talk about it, let's, let's let people hear it. It's, it's a comedic take, kind of a tongue-in-cheek take on the original song done in a techno form. Your take on this? <laughs> this was great. Um, this one uh, is, is funny because in 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 the time when I knew Kevin, I knew people from different eras of his career and what have you, but I'd never met Brian McLeod. And strangely, shortly after Kevin passed, uh, I mentioned my wife is a flight attendant before. She was on a flight from uh, Denver back to LAX, and uh, she said there was this guy that was obviously a musician in first class, and. Uh, they struck up a conversation and he said, Oh yeah, I was just uh, playing a track for Rod Stewart at this studio in, uh, in, in Boulder. And she knew that Pat Leonard had just built, uh, built the studio in Boulder. And so she was like, was it Pat Leonard? And he said, yeah, how did you know that? And then she mentioned Kevin that like, you know, my husband knew Kevin Gilbert and, and, and so Brian just like, he thought that was really cool. And they, they talked pretty much the whole flight because yeah. it was a, like kind of a red eye type flight and so there wasn't really much for her to do and uh they got into talking about caviar and you know he was telling her all about the caviar band and he gave her the Bugman stickers and stuff like that and uh uh and and one of the things that he talked about was uh you know one of the most fun times we had was recording this we did a version of the Cheryl Crow song 
strong enough. And, uh, uh, you know, and he was talking about like the kinds of things they'd say to each other is talking about like, no, 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 you know, more Bronsky beat more, you know, uh, more communards, you know, and, and, and uh, so I got to hear all about it before I'd actually heard the track. And I just like died laughing when I heard this. Once they, once they completed the song, they really wanted to get it into dance nightclubs. They wanted to have it because that was the rage at the time, you know, if Russ Parrish at the time was in, um, in a tribute band uh, playing all the disco boogie nights. yeah boogie nights he was playing all the, yeah. the disco stuff so um this would have fit right in and you know unfortunately that wasn't to be uh but Ket- ketamen that's the name of the band and it was it was brian mcleod and kevin gilbert they're just the two of them and they do all the instruments and vocals on this track and uh, there's two versions we're releasing right now the pet shop version the pet shop vocal version and kevin named there's two versions one's pet shop vocal and spandau vocal and he named them <laughs> after the voice that he tried to mimic or tried to come close to so um the spandau mix maybe that will be released in a in the future and as a digital download it is different and it's and it's humorous in its own take uh it would have been great to hear some more ketamine tracks i could have imagined i mean if they would have just tackled and done parodies of of you know mimicked other mocked other songs that were out at the time that would have been great you know stuff from other bands done their own cover album um so now we come to the the end of the album the 13th track and it is fall in love with me it's a caviar track and it was recorded in the spring of 96 and this was one of the first versions of fall in love with me that was recorded and um what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to play you a little bit of the original version. Now, when I say the original version, I'm talking about the original caviar version that they did. The original version that this is covered from is from Iggy Pop. And um, the caviar version, um, you'll hear the, I'll, I'll play them back to back so you can hear the difference. Here's the caviars. Now to get the vibe, I'm going to play the beginning of the one that's released on covers. So definitely a different vibe on that from the caviar version, the version that ultimately was released on caviar. The the caviar versions were a little bit more moody, and the fall in love version, the version on the covers is is more of a more of the original, I guess you would say, huh? Yeah, it's a lot more like the Iggy Pop original, and it seems like it's a little. I, it sounds like they just play at different speeds. I don't know if they actually played it faster, um, and it's a different take, or if it's just the same one slowed down a little bit but uh, just has a, a different energy about it. And I, I thought they were, when I first listened to both of them, I thought they were more different than they actually were. And when I started really kind of zooming in and ABing and stuff like that, I think uh, a lot of the elements like the, that, you know, obviously that high guitar, uh, high, sounds like a Leslie piano or mm-hmm. a guitar or something uh, is, uh, uh, I didn't think that was in the original. I didn't even remember it. And I listen and, 
it's there it's just kind of buried and it's not constant through the whole song but that's the way that the original Iggy Pop one is. I also like in the uh, covers version how the vocals just like way out front. Yeah, it's uh, you know uh, that's a uh, Kevin Ke you Kevin could pull that off with his voice, um, you know, partially just because of how he sounded in a room, and partially because of the amazing gear that he used to capture his voice. Yes, but uh, yeah, and you're you're correct on both accounts. It is there. It is some of the same instrumentation that was released on the Caviar Sessions, but it also includes different instruments. And um, you'll yeah. notice in the credits, there's a few different guitarists that are present there, one being John Rubin, so, uh, the ex who is the executor of Kevin's estate and who was Kevin's manager back in the time. And the funny thing about this was when I submitted this track listing and all the credits to John and he reviewed it and listened to it, he called me and he was just laughing, saying, wow, I... I I forgot about this guitar, you know, and they removed it for the final, for the final session. So you get John Rubin's guitar in here for this one. So it's that's pretty really cool. Yeah. And, and I don't think a lot of people know that that's Nick doing bass, Nick DiVirgilio on bass throughout. Right. So, I mean, it's Nick starts off the tune with them and it goes all the way through. So that's pretty cool. Cause Nick's not known for being a bass player, but in caviar, um, he wasn't really the drummer. He started off as the bass player. So, uh, that's it's pretty cool um yeah i used to i, I remember i saw uh, nick once with jonathan brooke at a little club and uh he had his he had like a a kick drum and uh and a hat on a stand that had a, a tambourine on it and so he's playing the the drums just like that with his feet while he's playing bass yeah. and singing back up and with that and the lush alternate tunings that jonathan used it sounded like there were like it four people yeah on stage and he did that him and and nick did that the two-man band thing for a while they did that the, yeah. the last the last few gigs of of thud were him and nick doing that um i love this this fall in love with me track it this is the highlight for me you know back in new york city is the highlight for you on this covers disc uh for me this is fall in love with me when you get to the end right here and you just it, it, it's a nice ending to it to the disc and you kind of smile. You kind of give a nice little nod to it. Um, well, that brings the end of this. Um, I want to tell you that the CD comes in two formats, standard edition and also the hologram numbered edition with a collector patch. There's a, a kind of cool patch that we're including with, um, with the hologram number edition and it's kind of a takeoff of uh kevin's service station jacket i mean you can get those patches we're gonna also offer those patches on kevingilbert.com uh, for you guys to check out there um that's pretty much it for this uh this covers one do you want to add anything about this release is there anything that surprised you the most shocked you um, something you wanted on here that wasn't is what, what do you have mark um no, I, I mean, really, the main thing is it's just it is always such a pleasure to get something uh, that I've never heard before. And for this for this one, I mean, there, there were some slight differences in things and what have you. I don't know if I had heard that version of Salisbury Hill. You mentioned that it was demoed for a performance. So I think I may have heard the performance, but not the demo. Um, and uh, uh but but the Joker just really like blew me away. It just hearing so, especially from the era that was like where I was kind of close to the mm -hmm. action and and you know going to see them all the time and just hearing a little gem pop out from that era that I never heard before. It always it kind of throws me for a loop sometimes. You know, it's just like wow, and you know it takes takes me right back to where it's like okay now I'm just gonna be listening to Gavin all week. <laughs> no, for sure. And you mentioned the Joker. Um, Use headphones. You listen to in your system, but also use some good headphones for this stuff because the the remix that John Cunaberti did is phenomenal. And for a lot of the material that Kevin has, when you listen on headphones, you really hear that all those spatial elements and and how he let a lot of the instruments breathe. And through the different mixes, you can hear where he wanted to go with certain instruments. So, um, so it's pretty good on that part. Uh, anything else? Not really. I mean, it's great. I, I loved it. I, I like, you know, it's, it, it's interesting to hear. It's like, you know, we have, we have uh, 
other ways of kind of like moving through Kevin's career and, and listening to his development as an artist. And it's kind of interesting to have the take of moving through his career in, in the kinds of stuff that he was covering so that, you know, you're not just hearing how he was changing as a musician, but you're hearing what his ear was tuned into over time and kind of getting to hear. I always enjoy, like I listen to Sirius XM, uh, the Beatles channel and stuff like that. And, and I always love it when, they play like, you know, it's like, hey, the Beatles were really into like the Coasters and Larry Williams and yeah. like all these people that just like, you know, and, and then you hear it and it's like, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, that totally, you know, that that totally makes sense. Right on. And Yeah, no, I mean, hearing some of the influences kind of brings a better light on their careers at times. Um, just to let people know, we have been. This disc was in the works for the past, I don't know, maybe six years. It was kind of sitting there in the back burner. Like I said, Kevin had it somewhat started and I came in there and um, the original title of this was going to be called Covers and Others uh, because there wasn't enough cover songs, I should say, until we located some more and decided to use also a couple of the live tracks. Um, but the others was were, were some tracks, some studio tracks that kind of didn't have a home. Um, but I can't say too much, but I guess they have since found a home. So let's leave yeah, it at yeah. that. So, um, so that's it. Um, uh, definitely check it out when you get it. There's the both copies, uh, the standard edition and the, uh, numbered hologram edition with collector patch. They're very limited. Once again, this was a gift to the fans and, um, the price tag alone just to to license and do all the royalties the mechanical royalties for this was you know a couple of grand so um so understand that this was definitely a gift to the fans to do because um uh, they could have just said no <laughs> so we get a kevin gilbert covers disc all right mark um thank you for joining us and we'll see you and everyone else next time you are here <laughs>